Good afternoon, everybody. This is Barb Pello, Group Director from InfoTrends, and I'm delighted that you could join us for Inkjet, the implications for book printing manufacturers and publishers, sponsored by Canon Solutions America. You know, for the past several years, the industry has been talking about a shift in digital book manufacturing, and it's really been driven by changing balance sheets and publishers' needs to better manage those inventories. Well, publishers' needs have existed for quite some time. The challenge has been making sure that the digital print technology is out there that's capable of achieve, achieving the quality, the speed, the flexibility, and the affordability of offset printing. What we're going to be doing today is really exploring the financial implications for printers and publishers as high-speed inkjet digital printing delivers enhanced make-ready and the ability to turn jobs around that we categorize with unparalleled speed. I'm joined by my colleague, Jim Hamilton, and we're going to be spending some time with you today talking about the emerging technology for inkjet book production, the impact of inkjet on the publishing market, and traditional offset versus high-speed inkjet business models, as well as spend a little bit of time talking about some emerging technologies for electronic book, electronic book publishing. Now, before we get started, I would like to make sure that everybody can enjoy the webinar. So first and foremost, if you're having any technical difficulties, let us know by using the Q&A box, or you can troubleshoot by clicking on the Help widget below. We'll be taking questions throughout the webinar. So if you have a question, merely submit it via the Q&A box. Make sure that you've disabled pop-up blockers. And if you want to see what the console can do, click on the Tips for Attendees widget for a complete rundown. Now for the agenda. We're going to talk for a few minutes about the changing dynamics in the book market, the publisher's challenge, how you can make a difference with inkjet technology, and wrap up with a few recommendations and conclusions. And with that, what I'm going to do is turn it over to my colleague, Jim Hamilton. Jim? Barb, thank you very much. Now, you mentioned that uh, users or, or listeners on the webinar could submit questions versus the Q&A, and also everyone who registered had a chance to submit questions ahead of time. So Barb and I have been thinking about those, and we'll look to address as many of those as possible during this, uh, this segment. So. Why don't we get started? I, I spoke at a workshop on books back in 2010, and I wrote about it at the time, and my top conclusions were content is or should be king, but many publishers weren't yet treating it that way. Second conclusion, publishing was becoming a service rather than a product. And the third, the days of big iron, high-volume book manufact manufacturing were coming to an end. Now, today I think all publishers would agree that content is king. They've adapted to a digital-first mode of publishing, and just about everyone is using just-in-time manufacturing and print-on-demand methods, methods in ways they never would have imagined 10 years ago. Now, in fact, with the onset of e-delivery, the entire definition of a book has evolved. Is the book the form, electronic book versus print book, or is it the content regardless of how it's delivered? I like to think of it as this latter way. We've long associated books with the physical static document that we see manufactured in large quantities after having been professionally authored and edited. But how important is that color cover and stack of monochrome internal pages? Why is the hardcover version delivered first and the soft cover second? On top of that, turmoil in the brick and mortar bookstores, the demise of borders, the appearance of e-readers, and the growth of Amazon.com speak to a world of books that is electronic, on-demand, connected, interactive, and personalized. These electronic advantages offer a level of immediacy and personalized content that users want in whatever way suits them best. It, it's back to why publishers have adopted that digital-first publishing mode. Gone are the days when the printed book was the center of the world. Yet, Print remains and continues to be an effective delivery method. And to understand where print fits, I'd like to talk to you about four important book printing definitions that will be relevant to our discussion today. So first, long run. Long runs are generally more than 1,000 books and often a lot more. This is the traditional distribution method of print, warehouse, and fulfill. These books are typically offset printed and use automated production finishing techniques for binding. 
Second category, short run. Short runs are generally less than 1,000 books. The, the mode of print, warehouse, and fulfill can be, comp, can be accomplished in this method with either production digital print, print uh, or offset, depending on the run length and the page count. Shorter runs, under 250 books or so, tend to be digitally printed. For this kind of strategy to work, order taking and finishing must be well suited to smaller job sizes. Now, print on demand. POD is true one-off printing in which the book is not printed until an order is received and there's no physical inventory at all. POD is only feasible with highly automated digital print and has become well accepted by publishers. Now lastly, interactive. Interactivity connects the physical book to the digital world using techniques such as quick response codes, QR codes, and augmented reality. Now all of this comes at a time when run lengths are declining and there's an increasing demand for custom, self-published, and photo books. According to a Pew Research Center study, the proportion of Americans who read e-books is growing, but few have completely replaced print books uh, with their electronic versions. The percentage of adults who read an e-book uh, has risen to 28%, up from 23%. And at the same time, about 7 in 10 Americans reported reading a book in print, up 4 percentage points after a slight dip in 2012, and 14% of adults listen to an audio book. Now, though e-books are rising in popularity, print remains the foundation of Americans' reading habits. Most people who read e-books also read print books, and just 4% of readers are e-book only. Audiobook listeners have the most diverse uh, reading habits overall, while fewer print readers consume books in other formats. InfoTrends research also shows that print remains a key source of revenue. Now, while a lot of focus has been placed on ebook formats, these print books still represent a very significant component of publishers' revenue, 76% in a study we did called Digital Media Adoption in Book Publishing. In that same study, we asked about the split between books that are digitally printed versus those that are offset printed. Digitally printed books represented just over 40% of printed books. However, looking forward, um, digitally printed books will become an even larger revenue source for those uh, service providers providing book, uh, book services. Now, InfoTrends tracks the application volume over key categories in digital print, and it's interesting to note how three categories dominate today's production, color, inkjet printing. These are transactional, promotional, and publishing. Transaction is the biggest, and that has a lot to do with the importance of white paper in, full color document out, color inkjet workflows. Within transaction, bills, statements, and transpromo are the key applications. Two other uh, application categories are important for inkjet. Within the promotional category, it's direct mail, and for publishing, it's books. These applications have a few things in common that make them attractive for inkjet. Many of these applications are printed on uncoded, uncoded papers. That's good since coded papers can present some operational and expense challenges for inkjet. More on that later. These applications, the ones that have been big for inkjet so far, are also often low coverage. Drying can become an issue with some inkjet methods as coverage increases as you lay more ink, ink down on the page. In addition, much of the cost of inkjet is built into inks. Higher coverage generally means higher cost. So in its recent digital production printing application forecast, InfoTrends found that books are the top production digital print application in terms of overall growth, adding more than 400 billion pages between 2012 and 2017. The digital printing of books benefits from the move to shorter runs, just-in-time manufacturing, and on-demand production that appeals to today's publishers. A message to remember in regard to books. While everyone is concerned that e-books will destroy printed books, that's not going to happen. Offset print will lose book volume, it's true, but much of that volume loss will be to the benefit of production digital print methods that are simply better suited to the production of books in today's just-in-time, on-demand world. Now, Barb, I know we've gotten some questions coming in, and I don't know if there's any um, that we should be addressing at this point. 
Um, I think one of the big things, Jim, that um, we got asked in terms of overall um, questions on the book market was, you know, there are there's a publisher that says, I don't offer on-demand technology. And where should an author go to seek these types of services? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's that's interesting because if you think back to fulfillment and those channels, I'm sure many of uh, many folks on the call will be familiar with Ingram's Lightning Source capability, uh, Amazon also with its Create Space on demand capability, and for those who may be amateur authors such as myself, uh, may look to something like Lulu.com to self-publish their books. So there really is a range there from the you know, the the very professional uh, distribution chain such as Ingram all the way to self-published authors who may want to use uh, uh, a method like uh, Lulu or other of those uh, services that are directed at self-publishers. Great. Thanks, Jim. All right. Okay, so let's let's take a look at these trends. This this summarizes it in a nice uh, nice way because again, we know there because of the ease of publishing and a lot of these self-publishing titles, there's a huge increase in the number of titles. At the same time, there's a shorter life cycle of some of the the knowledge that's being published out there. Want to get it out quick, want to have that accurate, want to have it updated. Sometimes delivery method in ebook can make that uh, that happen. And certainly in terms of the overall book publishing market, there's not necessarily a huge amount of growth. So the ability to identify and uh, really uh, take advantage of uh, niches and opportunities is important. We've seen decreasing run lengths, cost pressure on uh, both publishers and those who produce books for publishers, uh, a fragmentation of the book market, which it's great if it's possible to exploit, and then a significant amount of process automation so that uh, – um, shorter runs can be delivered more effectively, so that personalized content can be delivered, uh, so that orders can be, um, so the books basically can be um, produced only when an order comes up. And so this short run, this on-demand, this just-in-time manufacturing kind of world is very well suited to what's going on with Inkjet. So to summarize this first section, the good news is that digital print is creating new opportunities that didn't exist before, meeting market need for short runs, addressing this title proliferation, uh, creating higher page value through the addition of color, customization, or automized, uh, automated finishing. And then also, and I think this is really the key point, allowing new business models, mass customization, personalization, this whole self-publishing, uh, uh, increase in photo content, these are all key. And on the supply chain side, also the ability to do print-on-demand, just-in-time manufacturing, allow for test marketing to really leverage the, the uh, content that you have in back, back list. These are things that digital print allows in ways that Offset was not able to, to meet the need. So, Barb, I'd like to turn it back to you for the next before session. We, before we do that, I do have a couple more questions. Oh, okay, you, great. Yeah, First wonderful. of all, how is the trade industry embracing um, four-color inkjet quality? And then from an economical point of view, how are they making four-color inkjet work with low price points on their titles? Okay. So so first off, in terms of the trade marketplace, I'd have to say that on the inkjet side for color books, where a great deal of the success has been, has been around educational marketplaces. And so you see many uh, educational books, uh, you know, elementary to high school, uh, university kinds of texts, a little less on the trade side. I, I'd say in part because on the trade side, um, a lot of it tends to be black and white book blocks. And so uh, there's not necessarily been the acknowledgement on the trade book side that there's, there's room for color content in there. Now, I think we'll find some niches within there where color becomes important. And if it follows the example of what's happening in the educational marketplace, I think we can see some success there. Now, Barb, you were talking really about on the cost side as well. So I, I yes. will have more later in the presentation specifically on cost, but I think, uh, I think the point here really is that um, the high-speed inkjet brings the ability to do uh, you know, filling channel as needed in short runs to levels that just didn't exist before. That allows some things that, that couldn't necessarily happen. Is it going to be um, – I, I don't think it's necessarily fair to make a comparison to, let's say, uh, an offset book run of 100,000 that have been manufactured to get the cost per book down to very low levels to compare that with what you might do if you're filling the channel with 5,000 books at a time. 
Um, because you have to keep in mind that if you are filling the channel in smaller quantities, you're not necessarily uh, warehousing large quantities, so you don't have to worry about the warehouse space. You don't have to worry about that uh, warehoused uh, uh, content going out of, uh, you know, the content becoming irrelevant such that it couldn't be updated. Um, so all of those things, I think, change the cost equation to some point, but I will say that high-speed inkjet technologies have brought the crossover point much lower in comparison with offset, and we're seeing that, um, you know, we're seeing that move being made by the large uh, book printers and book publishers. Yeah, and Jim, we've got a number, and I want to make sure the audience knows that we're not ignoring them. We've got a number of questions on break-even points, and I think you'll address a lot of that uh, shortly. There is, um, there is yep. So we'll, we'll cover that, and, and, and I'll make sure we go, get back to the questions on cost. Okay. Um, I think one of the other areas that we wanted to share with you today is we did a lot of research with the publishing marketplace. And I think most of the publishers on the, on the line today know that every book is a gamble because clearly, in your case, demand is, is difficult to, fo to fo forecast. Um, in a lot of instances, a publisher will focus and has traditionally focused on unit cost. And what happens is that tends to favor offset printing. Um, but when you look at the cash outlay and the set of concepts around warehousing and inventory control, it really does promote a migration to digital technologies. The other thing that I think we're seeing with books today is that there's a different expectation from consumers. First of all, what you've got is you've got an environment where it's, they would like to be able to interact. They want to be participative. They want that content to be available anywhere, anytime, and they want it at a reasonable cost with the ability to deal with micropayments. Now, one of the things that we did is we actually went out and we surveyed 345 book publishers. And I think the first message on this slide is that clearly there's an embracing of the concept surrounding ebooks. And what you've got is that there's a decision made by more than 50% of the publishers out there on output format of a per publication basis. Another 30% produce ebooks and print editions for every title that they do. Now, the other component was when we looked at the marketplace of those that were not offering ebooks what we saw was that there was a clear plan to make sure that they were, in fact, embracing that in their future direction. In addition to that, when you take a look at backlist titles, 80% of the publishers that we survey have a strategy for backlists to ensure that those are, in fact, available in an ebook edition. Now, we also asked them about their priorities with ebooks, and we'll talk about this a bit later. But what they want to do is they want to deliver not just a book, but an experience. That means that they want to have great design and topography. They want to be able to embed within that ebook rich media, and they want to be able to do things like add live links. Um, beyond that, what the publishers today are doing, or what they told us they were doing, is actually focusing on the activities that deliver profits to their business. And that means that they're looking at how do I do a better job at selling? What publishing technologies should I be using? How do I embed in my business model new print and media trends? What are my new publishing business models? And how do I look at that content and monetize it in very different ways? And so when you start thinking about that migration to an on-demand world and the ability to seamlessly move in between electronic and printed models, there are really what I categorize as eight pretty good reasons for inkjet now. The first is that what you've got is the ability to do pre-production support for review copies, comps, and sales samples. Oh, by the way, you can mitigate and re re uh, reduce your risks associated with inventory, warehousing, and returns. You've got the ability to bring reprints, backlists, and out-of-print editions back into circulation. It gives you time to market for new and exciting titles. It gives you cycle time for on-demand production. I can do some interesting things with specialty books and self-published books. It opens the opportunity to move seamlessly between that print and that digital world and integrate with cross-media and interactive elements. 
and ultimately should deliver for the publisher improved bottom line results. And so the big message with all of this is technology is becoming your friend if you're in the publishing market, both in terms of content creation and making easy to use more sophisticated technology, produce books, lower production costs, and drive into that self-publishing market, as well as, by the way, reduce risk, inventory, let you do smaller press runs, and expand backlist titles. So with that, what I'm going to do is turn over to my colleague again, Jim, to have him spend some time talking through the inkjet side of technology. Jim? You know, Barb, before I start on that, there was a question about the term we used called backlist extension, and you spoke a little bit about backlist there. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me take a shot at that first, and then if you want to add sure. to it. But, but really, we're just talking about uh, uh, bringing books from out of print uh, uh, to current revenue, so taking advantage of some of that content that exists, so extending it in that sense. I don't think there's too much more to it than Barb, than that, Barb, but is there anything you would add to that? No, I, I, you're 100% right in terms of um, absolutely, uh, you know, being able to bring that book back into print, so you okay. got it. Very good. All right, well, let's look at the technology and see how Inkjet is changing the book printing marketplace. So... How, how has the market uh, managed to accept some of these very dramatic changes? From a warehousing and distribution perspective, publishers have historically looked to achieve low per unit manufacturing costs by printing long runs. Uh, this resulted in what we call the publisher's dilemma. So if a publisher says, if my forecast is off and I print too many books, I won't be able to sell them, and that's, you know, that's an honest uh, issue. Now, for production digital print methods, these allow distribution channels to be filled much more effectively in shorter just-in-time runs or in true on-demand production where the book is not printed until it is sold. Now, once the digital printer has become a virtual document warehouse, it helps solve warehousing and distribution is issues and addresses the publisher's dilemma. Now, for all of this to work, you also need workflow software, software that helps manage this process efficiently. So I think the important point here is what, what role does Inkjet have in this? We um, at InfoTrends have looked at page volume trends. So books and manuals are an application that has good growth opportunities for production digital print. Uh, InfoTrends is forecast at a 6.4% compound annual growth rate through 2017. Now, of course, a fair amount of this is not growth in the overall book market, but it's book printers and publishers realizing that production digital print provides a more effective method of manufacturing their printed content. This means that volume that would have been printed on offset presses is shifting to cut sheet and continuous feed digital devices at a rapid rate. Hey, Jim, I do have a quick question from the audience, and you may or may not know the answer to this. Yep. Um, but one of, the, one of the questions that came in from the audience was, what portion of inkjet equipment do you perceive as being installed in the book market? Oh, okay, so I would say probably, uh, let's say, somewhere between 20% and a third. So the biggest uh, number of inkjet, high-speed continuous feed inkjet devices are in the transaction marketplace doing invoices, bills, statements. The next largest seg segment, and I'd say probably a, you know, another third or so, uh, is in uh, just direct mail types of applications. So a lot of promotional direct mail uh, being done on inkjet devices. And third in that category would be books. So probably somewhere around 20% of the installed base would be doing that. Maybe a little bit less because you do have other applications that fit in there. Uh, there's some publication work, a little bit of newspaper. Uh, some people are doing a mix of different kinds of applications, a little bit of general commercial print. But I'd say probably about 20%. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim. Sure. Um, let me see. All right. So in terms of um, this table that I'm showing you here, this, again, is from our application forecast, the InfoTrends application forecast. And if you look at it, much of this digitally printed book and manual volume is monochrome. In fact, a lot of it is on cut sheet devices like the VarioPrint 6000. It's a big piece, but it's fairly flat, the monochrome side. We'll see a little more page growth for books and manuals for roll-fed. And you know, when I say roll-fed, I mean continuous feed uh, devices that print on a web of paper. But part of that is driven by monochrome inkjet units. 
tone or color, mostly cut sheet, still has good growth potential. But the biggest growth opportunity is in inkjet color, and virtually all of that is continuous feed on webs of paper. And we can see this as we look in the growth of placements uh, uh, of inkjet devices. So customer need combined with the availability of fast, high-resolution inkjet print engine engines has driven a remarkable increase of placements of continuous feed color inkjet systems beginning really in about 2008. And as I said, a lot of this activity has been in direct mail and transaction environments, but there's also been a significant amount of activity in books. In addition, for the book market, there have also been some placements of monochrome-only inkjet systems for books. So again, I've talked about uh, education and the color market there. Color really has been important. But for some book markets, monochrome is fine, and you'll see monochrome-only inkjet systems meeting that need. So now, generally, cost and productivity are the major barriers to the implementation of digital. And I suspect that's why we're getting so many questions that relate to what are the crossover points, you know, how, how much is the per unit price, those kinds of things. Um, but with inkjet, High levels of speed and productivity, they're, they're a given. Now, granted, as a user, you do have to have volumes of millions of impressions per month to hit the sweet spot of that technology. But that isn't an issue for many book printers. It follows, then, that if other print requirements are met for color capability, format, uh, the, the required substrates, uh, workflow automation, that there's also an opportunity for process improvement. Now. All of this brings um, about a new value proposition. So because in addition to very compelling cost per page metrics, these high-speed continuous feed inkjet systems allow true business model transformation related to customer operations, targeting and personalization, and of course profitability. These factors have huge business implications beyond the typical cost crossover curves. For book publishers, high-speed inkjet printing brings much greater flexibility to meet their publishing clients' needs, to fill channels appropriately and economically, while also allowing them to gain revenue from backlists and on-demand orders. Now, in terms of the overall workflow tools, uh, of course, to meet client needs for just-in-time manufacturing and on-demand orders, the workflow has to be optimal. You know, let's have a look at a workflow diagram that Infotrends created for a premier study we did a while back. Uh, it shows streamlined workflow, and it shows how streamlined workflow can allow publishers to meet demand and fill their distribution channels more effectively. Automation through intelligent workflows can help production sites manage this process, process from job submission through final production. It's important to note here um, how the workflow and output management component not only leads to print production, but also to ebook creation and archiving. Hey, Jim, I've got a quick question on this one. Um, one of the audience members asked how most publishers in integrate their order management and finance systems with third-party digital print-on-demand suppliers. Could you give some insight there? Sure, sure. That, that's, a really, uh, that's a really great question because uh, if you're going to automate processes like this, they've got to extend into uh, what we'd call print MIS, uh, the, the finance systems that they're describing there, uh, but also into other aspects of the workflow. Now, to a great extent, that's built around JDF types of workflow and the ability to translate job ticket information across a workflow using JDF is, is great. Um, it's got to be built out in practice, and that's not always that easy. You will see some, uh, some sites doing a lot of their own software development to make some of these things happening. I'd say the promise of JDF is that in the future, we'll see even more capability to do more of a plug-and-play uh, kind of mode. But I do think that all of the producers of print uh, MIS software understand how important it is to make that integration a top priority. Great. Thanks, Jim. Sure. So, um, how about some of the digital advantages? Um, there are three digital advantages that I think are key to success from a book perspective. Electronic collation, just-in-time man manufacturing, and workflow automation. Now, electronic collation means that the book can be printed in page order, or honestly, in any order that suits the production process. And this is really important because it allows the inline creation of book, book blocks that are ready for binding. So think about what happens on an offset side with the creation of signatures and then offline folding and cutting. 
uh, you can have fully collated book blocks coming off of the, uh, the end of an inkjet device, and that's a huge automation gain. Now, just-in-time manufacturing provides the ability to fulfill the publisher supply chains as needed, as I've spoken about before, and getting around the publisher's dilemma. Workflow automation, that means really that one operator can handle a production color inkjet system, and depending on the finishing con uh, configuration, is able to handle tasks that are typically the responsibility of multiple operators in an offset environment. So think about plate making, press operation, finishing all, for example. Now, another benefit is that this removes plate making from the printing process, which has ecological benefits on top of it. So you're not worried about disposal of plate making chemistry. Now, digital workflows, there are really some very significant differences between digital and offset. And this comes back to, to our discussions around what's the value and how it, how it can be applied. Um, with offset, the page imposition is set up in a multi-page signature. So these are folded, gathered, stitched. And, and often a lot of this happens offline. But with digital, that electronic collation provides much greater flexibility so that full book blocks can be delivered automatic. And this makes books of one, personalized workflows, really possible. Now, while these benefits apply to both toner-based and inkjet-based digital print equally, inkjet has taken digital productivity to the next level. And so it's really moved uh, uh, digital production processes forward, allowing much larger quantities of books to be produced very cost-effectively. So, Barb, that wraps up my section for that. I turn it over to you for your discussion of Print the Mobile. Hey, great. Thanks. I think one of the other big implications in when you start taking a look at the publishing marketplace is we're starting to see the emergence of workflow tools that are really helping the book market significantly. And when you think about it, it's estimated that in just three years there's going to be a billion tablets in use globally. Um, and so what we're finding is this concept of BYOD or bring your own device is becoming a market reality. What it's doing is it's opening, uh, and a lot of these software tools are opening the ability for book manufacturers to participate. And what we're starting to see are a number of tools emerge that are really letting you do multi-channel publishing through workflow automation. They're helping support a broad mix of your customers' communications needs. And finally, what they're doing is they're meeting that pu publisher desire to incorporate rich content, live links, and make that publication interactive. And they're doing that in the con context of not only um, delivering a print edition, but then simplifying the process for migrating that print to the realm of mobile. In parallel, these same tools are working to build robust analytics that will measure and track things like page views, click-through rates, and a number of other items. And what you've got is the ability to publish content across channels and deliver that content where it's consumed. And so what we're seeing are a number of tools emerge in the marketplace, uh, ranging from GTXL, Amiris, Inkling Habitat, the Adobe Digital Publishing Suite, uh, Quark Digital Publisher 2.0, Xerox Freeflow Digital Publisher, and more. These tools will take, uh, in essence, a standard workflow and let you capitalize on the concept of migration to a mobile edition that really does incorporate a lot of the elements that publishers are asking for. It means that not only can I have a print edition, but I can, in essence, engage and immerse that reader in the publication. I've got the ability to reach a larger audience I can extend, if I want to, advertising opportunities, um, and we're seeing book publishers start to look at that as an option. I can create engaging ads and video. I can get to know what my reader wants better. I've got access to indexing and searching and uh, good human interaction. I can incorporate those live feeds, and I can have them be true to the print section, and I can tell a much, much more compelling story. And so I tell everybody, take the time to understand the fact that, well, print isn't going away. The ability to repurpose that content for engaging mobile editions and the workflow associated with that is becoming much more uh, robust and easy to access in the marketplace today. Now what we're going to do is turn back to Jim and talk about a few of the cost factors associated with inkjet, since I know we have a lot of break-even analysis questions. 
You know, it's, it's interesting. We're getting a number of great questions coming in, and thank you very much for that. You know, one of them that I saw was whether, you know, in this discussion we're actually suggesting that, uh, um, you know, publishers bring this kind of inkjet uh, system in-house. And, and I, I think that's, that's much less likely to happen. These are multi-million dollar systems. There are a number of different service providers who are integrating it into their capability. So I, I don't necessarily expect to see that kind of move happening in the marketplace. So, um, and Barb, we'll take some other questions as we move through this, but uh, sure. again, I, I think there's some great, uh, great questions coming out of this. So let's, let's start now and look at uh, Inkjet in terms of a cost perspective. Now, as, as we look at these uh, you know, cost lessons for Inkjet, there are a few important things I'd like to point out. The, the first is that the acquisition price, though significant, and this is you know, multi-million dollars, um, it's a relatively small portion of the overall cost when you look at the cost of that device um, over the, the number of sheets that are, that are produced. So when a, a million dollar plus acquisition is spread out over five years and hundreds of millions of impressions, it only amounts to a, a few mils or, or tenths of a penny per letter size page of that equipment investment. Now, what's, what tends to be more uh, important are consumables, primarily inks, and then also the service and maintenance. Now, because of this, because of the importance of the inks in this, the area print coverage has a significant impact on the overall running cost. The higher the coverage, the higher the cost. Therefore, a low coverage page, perhaps just monochrome text and a logo, will cost less to produce than a high coverage page with tints, solid areas of color, and or photographs. The last cost lesson is the importance of the paper. Any running cost calculations need to take paper into account because, as you'll see shortly, paper is a very large cost contributor. This is also true for other printed projects, but in some cases, inkjet systems require pre-treated papers which are more expensive than commodity stocks. And though inkjet-treated stocks have decreased in price over time, they still may cost as much to 10 to 30% more than comparable untreated stocks. Jim, we've got a quick question here, and that's sure. the quality question. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the quality of the product and you look at inkjet versus offset, can the end consumer tell the difference? I, I think increasingly no. Uh, I, I would say if you're talking about toner-based um, output, they generally can detect sort of the shiny, uh, shiny nature of high-coverage toner. But when you're talking about high-speed inkjet, particularly on the education marketplace, and again, that may have different quality uh, requirements in some other areas, let's say whatever, coffee table books, uh, for example. But in that marketplace, I've heard print service providers basically say, you you know, uh, an observer, uh, may, you know, cannot tell the difference between the uh, offset printed output and the inkjet printed output. And that has been key in allowing them to move forward these kinds of programs because if they provide, uh, you know, let's say books at different points of the life cycle with different uh, digital or different uh, printing technologies, then they really have to match up. And this has allowed that to happen, the, the nature of high-speed inkjet. But I'd say that particularly around the educational marketplace, as you go to higher coverage, and I'll get into a little bit more later about uh, coded papers and the higher coverage part of, part of things, um, I think at that point there's still a little bit more work to do on the inkjet side, but I think it will get there. And, and Jim, I have one other quick question as long as we're on this, kind of on this topic, but the question is, do you think publishers should bring inkjet printers in-house? How much do they cost, or should they be looking for a partner that's a service provider? Oh, yeah. I, I saw that, that question, Barb, and I was, you know, my, my initial thought is no. I don't think that that's something that you bring in in-house. Um, the the high-speed continuous feed inkjet systems are typically, uh, let's say, one, two, three, up to five million dollars, and that's not including some of the things that you would need to do uh, as a front end or a back end capability. So, what would you build in for ordering, print MIS, workflow, and then the finishing capability? So, in many of these sites, we see very significant. Um, uh, inline finishing that goes from the roll of paper 
it's a stack book block. And that investment in finishing can, can really be uh, comparable to the cost of the, the printing device. So, no, I don't see publishers bringing this in-house. I think there are uh, a, a wide range of service providers who can help um, you know, provide these kinds of services. Uh, and, and really, uh, I, I think it's unlikely that they'll, they'll bring it in-house. Great. Thanks, Jim. Sure. All right, so let's look at some of these cost components then. There are six major cost components for these systems. So it's equipment, maintenance, consumables, inkjet heads, paper, and, and other overhead. So in addition to the capital acquisition cost of the equipment, there are ongoing maintenance charges that can be handled in a variety of ways, but typically they come in as a fixed month, monthly maintenance along with a set click or per foot charge that is multiplied by the volume printed in any given month. Now, sometimes users prefer what we call an all-in or comprehensive click that includes service and consumables together. Now, for the most part, the major consumables are the inkjet ink, so there are some related supplies that contribute a relatively small cost component. The type of ink has an in impact on cost as well. Systems may offer dye and pigment-based inks. Now, in general, dye inks are less expensive but do not have all of the durability and uh, other benefits of pigment inks. Dye inks are typically the ink of choice in lower coverage, transaction, or direct mail applications, while pigment inks are preferred where higher quality is desired, particularly when printing on coated papers. So when you're on those coated papers, you want to have that higher quality level, and it tends to be pigment inks. Now, inkjet heads for these systems do wear out over time and need to be replaced, and as discussed, paper can be a very big cost contributor. Now, in the end, there are two ways to look at cost. The first is running cost, which considers just the cost of the machinery, its supplies, and maintenance. The other is total cost of operations, sometimes shortened to the acronym TCO, which includes everything, not just direct equipment costs, but the operator's wages, insurance, rent, sales and marketing expenses, and, and any other uh, overhead. Now, ink usage is, is a real big piece of it, particularly around color output. Many examples uh, use 20% color coverage assumed. That would be 5% for each of the processed colors, so cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. 20% um, is a fairly colorful page, but it's nothing approaching the high levels of coverage that you might have in a full-page photograph. So some pages, such as text with color headings, line art, or a logo, may be very uh, much lower in, uh, in coverage. Now, higher or lower coverage changes ink consumption significantly with the resulting cost impact. Printing system vendors typically provide software that allows you to estimate your coverage levels and thereby track your ink consumption and estimate your costs. Now, here, what we've done in this table is to create a look at the impact of print volume on overall uh, um, cost distribution. So using a cost of about six mils, so six tenths of a cent for each eight and a half by 11 sheet, we've made an estimate of the cost impact of paper related to other aspects like uh, equipment, monthly service, click charge, and ink. So at five million impressions per month, equipment is the largest component. You can see there that it's about 26%. Uh, now, um, this is about a, a quarter of the total cost. Now, and, and really not very far behind at 5 million in impressions behind uh, the paper cost. So in general, fixed costs like equipment uh, and monthly service fee become a smaller part of overall cost as volume increases. Equipment, for example, drops from about 26% at 5 million impressions to about 8% at 30 million. Cost components such as click charges and ink increase as volume increases. Both are around 12% and end up around 23% at 30 million impressions. So paper is the second largest cost component when you look at it at 5 million impressions and accounts for close to half of the cost at 30 million impressions. Although, you know, it's possible that uh, a, a print service provider would get volume discounts for paper that could bring this number down a little bit. Now, another thing to look at is black-only printing because that's key around many book applications. Black-only printing has a much different and lower cost profile. So 20% ink coverage on a black-only page, for example, would be very high coverage for a monochrome page, but not entirely unusual if there were a lot of halftone images or white text dropped out of a black background. A typical text-only uh, text black page, though, would generally be less than 5% coverage. 
So it's important to know that black ink is much less expensive than process color inks, the, the cyan, magenta, and yellow. And in addition, the click charge for a monochrome page, the click or the service charge, it's much less than that for a color page. So monochrome only work would, uh, would not necessarily be at some of the cost levels of the color, color pages, as you'd, you'd expect. Now the ink and, and click cost for black only printing could be as much uh, as 50% less than for color. And given that black pages may require less coverage, this lower coverage would add to the cost savings. So Jim, I do have a quick question on this one. How, how well uh, does this work with lightweight paper, you know, below 30 pounds with just black ink? Yeah, so I think, I think when you're looking at uh, printing on light paper, the, the biggest potential issue is show through. So, you know, you'll see the text from one side of the sheet coming through others. I believe that there are 30-pound papers that will work for these processes, but my recommendation would be to be sure that you test it out to see that that, uh, that, that pays off in fact. Um, part of the reason I say this is that there are a number of different methods that can be done to reduce that show through. One of them would be using an inkjet treated paper that keeps the ink closer to the surface of the sheet. And so you might choose to use an inkjet treated paper to get to a lighter stock where show through wouldn't be an issue. And then also, many of these systems allow you to adjust the density on the black ink. So, you know, if you put down 100% black for text and those kinds of things, you know, any black elements, uh, you may get actually a fairly dense black if you don't put down as much ink. And so that sort of adjustment to sort of ratchet back on the amount of ink laid down in certain areas can have a cost-saving effect, for one, less ink would be consumed, but it could also have an impact on show-through because, again, less ink being laid down in a certain sheet. But it becomes very much a, a question about the substrate you're using, whether it's uh, pre-treated uh, uh, to be suitable for inkjet, uh, and also whether it's a dye or a pigment-based ink. Thanks, Jim. Sure. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit more about paper then, because the inkjet system vendors have really been doing what I think is a very nice job about working together with the paper mills so that there is a broad availability of, uh, of suitable papers. And a lot of that work has been around the book publishing segment. So uncoated commercial papers include mechanical and craft papers. Uh, some of them are inkjet treated. Some of them are just conventional untreated uh, papers that are used on offset and can be shifted over to digital devices. Uh, lightweight, lightly coated papers suitable for trade, workbook, educational publishing, they're also available. More work being done in this area. I'd say that the earliest successes have been on uncoated stocks and then lightly coated stocks. And ongoing testing and development is in progress that will provide even more options. And I think where we'll see more and more options moving forward will be around uh, more heavily coated stocks, more glossy stocks, ones that may be more suitable for coffee table books, photo books, and actually general commercial types of applications. So when cost becomes an issue, uh, cost-sensitive environments such as uh, you know, transaction and direct mail um, they, they tend to uh, look for further cost benefits in a couple of ways. They use dye-based inks, which typically cost less than, than pigment-based inks, and they may print light or low coverage on uncoated commodity stocks. And again, the cost of the paper is key here. But book publishing environments are typically a little bit more quality sensitive and therefore are more likely to use pigment-based inks and inkjet treated papers, which bring with them some added expense. Now, lightly coated papers are the norm for many book publishing ac applications, and so this becomes part of the, the cost of doing business there. Now, if you're comparing crossover points, it's important to note that digital print technologies often compete against offset presses that are already paid for. Now, naturally, this becomes a part of the overall cost equation, and really it can't be ignored when comparing the two technology. Yet, in this case, it only impacts the aspect of, of the contribution of the equipment cost. Now, processes that happen off-press should also be a consideration since conventional processes may require warehousing, additional finishing requirements, or they, they may not be cost competitive for just-in-time manufacturing of smaller batches. All right, well, that, that wraps up the, the cost section for now. I know you guys will have more questions, but let me turn well, it back I, to, to Barb. Okay. No, I'm going I'm to, before we wrap up with recommendations and conclusions, Jim, I'm going to let you respond to a number of these questions. Oh, you bet. Got in. Sure. Um, and and let's, let's start with, can you compare the differences 
between Toner Beast digital web presses and inkjet. You know, there's cost and speed differences. Um, the uh, audience participants at Toner Beast digital web usually competes with offset up to 1500. Um, where do you think the offset versus digital can compete, or offset versus inkjet can compete? Okay, so um, when we look at the book marketplace, there have been a lot of toner-based continuous feed devices that have met the needs of that market very well, uh, very cost competitively. There's not a lot of new development being done by the vendors of those types of system in that area because they're seeing the activity around the inkjet side of the market to bring particularly color to that, uh, that, that marketplace. So we see a fair amount of that. Um, I, I would say that the crossover point, whether you call it 1,000 or 1,500 or, or 500, depends a lot on the technologies that people have in-house and sometimes what is paid off. If you have a site that has a toner-based continuous feed device that is paid off, that your employees know how to service, and that you're basically paying for toner and some replacement parts, you can be very, very cost effective on that type of device. Would you bring in a monochrome inkjet device to replace that? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, when you when you make in a changing technology, particularly one that could be a very very significant investment. On the color side, though, bringing in a color device that allows you to do a range of color capabilities. So, uh, I mean, some people think of color as, uh, let's say, a, you know, a full color magazine or a coffee table book. But the use of color to, say, do headings, bring in logos, highlight colors, um, some use of, of photography, but maybe not extensive use of that, means that there really is a spectrum from black and white print to low coverage color to more extensive use of color. And I, I think that plays into that overall discussion. I do think that um, there's opp further opportunity in monochrome for inkjet. But what we've seen, uh, where we've seen most of the, the, you know, the active development, it really has been around color for, for inkjet. And Jim, I've got a couple more. Um, how well does the end product hold up? And you know, does it fade? Can you get it wet? Does it rub? Does it scratch off as compared to offset? Right. Okay. So from you know, there's a little bit of a difference here between the dye based and the pigment based inks. The pigment based inks tend to be a little bit more durable. So application to application, you you really just need to look at that and test it. I think given that these are aqueous based inks, there are sometimes some issues if you are you know really sub submerging it in water, but you have to you know you have to to significantly wet some of these pages to see any kind of distortion. But that would be something if you, you know, if you're putting together a manual to be used by a linesman who's going to be out in all kinds of weather, uh, it may be that some sort of, uh, of lamination or coating would make sense. And there are uh, devices that build in some kind of uh, post-process coating. Now, these tend to be used more in direct mail types of environments, say you're sending a postcard out or a self-mailer, where you know that piece is going to take a beating. Uh, where it is a page inside a book that really is fairly well protected, generally people don't go to those lengths. And from what I'm seeing, there are very good results. Again, I'm not uh, you know, in the market out there with rub testers and those, those kinds of things, but I think that there is very good uh, results for that. But I think for any publisher looking at this with their suppliers, they just need to be sure um, you know, that their supplier is confident that in that with the application that they're, they're bringing forward. Okay, and then one last question, and we didn't get to everybody's questions, and there were a lot of them. We will absolutely get back to you, and we'll send you email responses. But one last question, and it's, does inkjet printing look pixelated under a, under a loop? Um, you know, most of these devices are 600 dpi, and at 600 dpi, you really do not see what I would describe as pixelization. Now, where you may see some impact is uh, in areas where there are tints. So if you were printing a logo that was, uh, you know, a, a yellow and a red on top of each other, and the red was, uh, you know, a 30 or 40 percent, you may, uh, you know, be able to see uh, the individual ink droplet size. Um, now, you in a similar situation, if it was four color offset, you might very well see the you know the half tone screen. So I don't necessarily think that that um, 
uh, well, that nature of the artifact at 600 by 600 DPI is really noticeable. But again, uh, if you're an educational publisher, I'd say no need to worry. If you are a photo book or a you know, coffee table publisher, it might become more uh, of an issue for you. Great. Thanks, Jim. Well, I'm going to just wrap up with a couple of final thoughts. And again, we will respond directly to your questions from the webinar. But I think what you've all got to accept is that we're in a mode now, especially in the publishing industry, where the technology is available to help you drive pro profit. And it's going to help you manage a complex array of issues and systems in, that cut across content management and distribution, including both physical as well as electronic mechanisms. First, next and, and of equal importance is all of a sudden now you don't need to worry about that physical inventory in the warehouse space. You can do what you need, when you need it, on demand. Um, there are a number of outsourcing solutions to provide physical logistics and warehouse services. And you can integrate with your distribution partners and help get both time to market as well as, as, well as expand your reach. Um, you're going to see that technology is going to support workflow solutions that will help you not just drive production in terms of print, but also take that same printed document and repurpose the content for a mobile world. Um, you're going to see faster speeds, high quality, and a wider array, array, array of substrates. Um, you'll be able to integrate into distribution channels, and you'll be able to blend that electronic and mobile service model uh, with your portfolio of offerings. So I. My, my simple final message is that I think that publishers are in a unique position today. I think there's going to be new opportunities for titles to be introduced and reintroduced, new channels to help you do a better job at formatting uh, content for a mobile world and distributing titles. Your risks are going to be mitigated. Um, you'll be able to have more access to capital uh, to run your businesses, new business models, and ultimately, drive more profits for your business. We're out of time now, but I would tell you that if you've got additional questions, take a couple minutes to submit them, and we will absolutely respond to them. I know there was a lot of them that we didn't quite get to today. Um, we'd like to thank you for attending the webinar, and if you want additional information about our webinar series, visit bookbusinessmagazine.com. And what we'd like to also do is, again, thank Canon Solutions America for sponsoring this webinar. If you've got a minute, we'd appreciate it if you take a couple seconds to fill out our feedback survey. Thanks again to everybody, and have a great day.